How would humanity react to the discovery of extraterrestrial life? Life significantly more advanced than here on Earth. If creatures who might as well to us be gods gave us instructions to build a machine, would we build it? Is there proof of intelligent design hidden deep within mathematics? Those are some of the questions asked by Carl Sagan's famous novel Contact, his only fiction book and one of my favorite portrayals of a first contact scenario. Today, we'll discuss contact and humanity's first journey to an extremely strange place. Now, all the information today is based on the novel rather than the movie, though I will use scenes from the movie because in broad strokes, they're fairly close. Contact takes place largely, except for chapters surrounding the main character, Dr. Ellie Airways, childhood in the mid to late 90s. The Earth is pretty similar to what we'd expect, with some of Sagan's optimism leaking through. For one, the next Einstein, Dr. Ada, has been born, and he's developed a unified theory of everything, which they call super unification. Some very rich humans are living in orbit, but on the other hand, the Soviet Union has never dissolved, and the Cold War is still slightly simmering. This isn't intended to be an alt-future novel or anything. These, I think, were Sagan's genuine predictions. In the mid-1980s, Dr. Ellie Arroway is head of the Argus Project with the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI. She's headquartered at the Very Large Array in New Mexico and is using it to search the night sky for evidence of extraterrestrial signals, mostly through radio waves. Much of this process is actually automated through the supercomputers of the Very Large Array, but after several years, literally no progress has been made. There's been no evidence of extraterrestrial life, and there's a surge of both scientific and political desire to end funding for the project, giving the satellite time to more worthy causes. That is, until the discovery of the message. It all starts in the middle of the night when the facility's computers pick up a very strong radio signal, which they're able to attach to the star Vega within the Lyra constellation. It's very close to Earth, only 26 light years away. 16 of the radio telescopes are picking up the signal, and it's so strong that even some sophisticated amateur radios could pick it up. The signal is also coming in a clear pattern, which does not seem to arise within nature. On the other hand, at only a few hundred million years old, Vega is a very young star, and the planets are not yet fully formed, making the development of intelligent life in the system most likely impossible. There's also a debris field, however, when all military, commercial, scientific, or just generally Earth-based origins of the signal are excluded, the scientists theorize that it could simply be a message relay or a space station in the Vegan system. However, the truly startling revelation comes when the binary within the signal is converted to base 10, and it's revealed that the Vegan broadcast contains prime numbers. A prime number is an integer which can only be divided by itself and one, and Vega is broadcasting them in order. Two, three, five, seven, eleven. It goes on seemingly forever, meaning it's very unlikely to be as a result of some natural astrophysical process. Because the telescope array is about to lose sight on Vega in the sky, Dr. Arroway and the SETI crew immediately begin contacting observatories and radio installations across the globe to establish constant monitoring of the star. News of the signal slowly leaks out to the public, but as the astronomers, physicists, and the White House are preparing an official response, it's discovered that there's more information hidden in the message than at first glance. Embedded within the signal's polarization modulation is three-dimensional information and also audio. It turns out to be a broadcast of Hitler at the 1936 Olympics. Obviously, the discovery of Hitler contained in the alien message is quite alarming, although there's a rational explanation. Hitler's speech was the first television signals powerful enough to leave Earth and actually be detected by a receiver in space. The Vegans receive the message, they amplify it, they clean it up, and they sent it back to Earth in what seems to be, as with the prime numbers, a wink and a nod at humanity. So, the German signal leaves Earth at the speed of light, it travels 26 light years to Vega, the Vegans sit on the signal for a few years, then they send it back to Earth hugely amplified, indicating as well that they are extremely technologically advanced. There are other indications of the Vegan technological advancement. For one, it seems more and more clear that this is a space-based signal, and they've also simplified the entire process for humanity by removing the Doppler effect and more. However, as time goes 
on, more and more to the message is discovered. When talking to the president, Dr. Arroway likens it to a palimpsest, which was basically a piece of parchment that was written over again and again. There's the prime numbers, then underneath the prime numbers, there's the Hitler transmission. Underneath that, however, is an absolutely massive amount of data. The Vegans are sending pages and pages of something as labeled in binary arithmetic. Tens of thousands of pages. Although trepidatious about what may be sent, the governments of the Earth create a coalition to collect everything. No single nation is able, because of the limitations of geography on a sphere, to capture all the data itself. The planet is spinning, no country has a powerful enough telescope in space, no single nation has telescopes across the globe, so the Soviets, the Americans, and many, many other countries start recording the message. No one's sure of whether it will actually repeat or how long the cycle will be, so there's extreme redundancy taken so that nothing is missed. The Soviets even have special ships in the ocean, ensuring complete coverage. The problem is, upon receipt, the data is unintelligible. There's no way for humans to discover it. However, there's hope that when the message loops, a primer will be discovered. Basically, a cipher to understand what the aliens are sending. Slow progress is made through cryptographic methods, including those supplied by the NSA, but it seems unlikely that the signal will be fully decoded without help from the Vegans. As this is happening, the populace of Earth is coming to grips with the fact that they're not alone in the universe. New religions, including doomsday cults, have sprung up, which aligns with the upcoming end of the 20th century. Religious fervor is at an all-time high, and there are many who want to embrace the message, but many too who want all radio telescopes to be turned off. As more and more of the message comes in, it seems clear that the Vegans are giving instructions on how to build a machine. This increases tensions even within the scientific and political leaders of the nations of Earth. Some suspect that the Vegans are sending instructions on how to build a bomb so that humanity will be destroyed. Others believe that it will open a teleporter so the Vegan armies can march onto Earth. But the desire for progress continues, and this is most likely due to the fact that even if they ignore Vega in the signal, the star is only 26 years away. If the Vegans wish to destroy humanity, they can do so. Eventually, it's nearly certain. The Vegans are sending instructions on how to build a dodecahedron-shaped vehicle of some sort with room for five human passengers. Later, the message repeats, however, still with no primer. However, with the help of S.R. Haddon, a tech pioneer who developed several signal-based technologies, including one which made television ads and television networks obsolete, a fourth and final level of the palimpsest is discovered, the primer. Through this new information, humanity is able to translate the instructions within the signal. The machine consortium, which is humanity's joint effort to discuss and make decisions about the signal, decides to start construction. Creation of the machine requires much of the Earth's economic output. Entire new industries in cities are created. There are numerous advancements in material sciences, and both the Americans and Soviet Union are attempting to create the machine first. It's not like the space race though, per se. Whichever machine is built first, there will be a Soviet and American crew. This is a cooperative effort, and I think that's part of the genius of the signal being sent across the planet. It ensured that no single superpower could do everything. The Earth had to cooperate. Five crew members are selected, I'll come back to that in a second, and as the American machine nears completion, the world is overcome by a sense of unity. Nuclear disarmament has continued, the number of hostile actions between nations is ever diminishing, and a sense of shared humanity has developed across the world in expectation of this greater adventure and joining the galactic community. Unfortunately, the American machine is destroyed during a terror attack, which also kills David Drumlin, one of the American passengers and former PhD supervisor of Ellie Arroway. Unfortunately, largely due to issues in Soviet organic chemistry, the second machine is also way off track and seems to perhaps be outside possible completion. When all seems lost, the billionaire S.R. Haddon, who has received many construction and technological contracts related to the machine, reveals that he has secretly been building a third copy in Japan. Ellie is given one of the seats, as are four international scientists 
scientists, including the new Einstein, Dr. Ada, and one of Ellie's Russian contemporaries, Vege Lunacharsky. By the way, Vege has got to be one of my favorite characters in the novel. You go in with certain expectations of what the Soviets will be like, what their relationship with the American scientists will be like, but again, probably some of Sagan's optimism leaking through, Vege completely flips that on his head, and I love the character. Anyway, in 1999, the machine has finished completion. Humanity, still not quite sure what it does, but the desire to know beats all out, and a date for the use of the machine is set New Year's Eve 1999. The machine has no seatbelts, it has no storage for food, it has no bathrooms, it's just the dodecahedron, a sort of complicated moving series of shells, and five interior seats all facing each other. It's built to its exact specifications, unlike the movie I'll note, and the five brave adventures enter it preparing for a journey which will define humanity. As the machine starts up, those inside have a feeling of falling through the earth into the event horizon of a black hole. Those within the machine feel like they're traveling through a tunnel and they emerge in the Vagan system. There, they find a massive object, seemingly an alien radio telescope, but not much else. However, they're pulled towards another much larger black hole and pulled towards what some of them see as a subway station station, a terminal of various tunnels where someone can get off and go somewhere else. They are seemingly taken on a sightseeing tour of the galaxy before emerging at what the crew believes is the center of the galaxy with two supermassive black holes and a series of gates. The gates seem to be designed for different civilizations, small gates for humans and human-sized starships, much larger gates for presumably much larger creatures. Features. What's staggering is the diversity indoors and the sheer number, indicating that humanity is in truth just a small part of a much, much larger galactic community. The dodecahedron eventually lands on a strange and alien beach, a beach which almost seems like paradise to the crew. They lounge on it for a day, they enjoy the water, they eat crabs and coconuts, they go for a swim, and they go to sleep. In the morning, a strange door is discovered. Discovered. It sits in space, but only exists from one side. Slowly, each member of the expedition goes through the door, with the exception of Dr. Arroway, who feels extreme unease. She stays on the beach for the rest of the day, before being approached by her long-dead and much-loved father. It is, of course, not actually her father, but it's a perfect recreation of him, and it's revealed that it's an avatar through which the beings are using to communicate with Ellie. The beings seem benevolent, but they have raided her dreams and the dreams of her companions to understand humanity. There was the belief among many on the crew that they were traveling to the station for some sort of test which could allow humanity to enter the greater galactic scene, but instead the beings took everything they needed in an instant. Much about the true nature of the universe is revealed to Ellie in these moments. The beings are not only advanced, but far, far more advanced than the scientists on Earth had predicted. Projected. For one, they're not there to lift humanity per se into the next stage of being. They're self-described census takers. They've done this for many, many civilizations. They're not sheriffs gunning down the ones that pose a real threat to other life, because usually those civilizations are self-destructive anyway. They are, however, giving humanity a little nudge, not only through the technologies just learned through the creation of the craft, but also in the universe unifying nature of receiving the message, coming together as a species to decipher it and create the machine. However, there are some even more incredible revelations. For one, Ellie learns that Cygnus A, an extremely strong radio source outside the galaxy, is actually a creation of several species, not only in the Milky Way galaxy, but several galaxies. Its purpose is to stop entropy and to stop the inevitable decay of the universe. The idea that there are several 
civilizations of this tier working together is truly staggering. But what's more, it's revealed that the wormholes used to travel through the galaxy were not created by the species Ellie is now talking to, nor any of the species now active in the Milky Way galaxy. These incredible constructs are from an even earlier time, and the creators seemingly left without a trace. Where they went, no one knows, but given how advanced the other species in the galaxy are, it's most likely not somewhere purely physical. Thus, the species which remain sometimes refer to themselves as the caretakers. However, there's one even more incredible revelation. The caretakers have discovered something deep within nature, a fundamental natural aspect of the universe which seems artificial, a message within the laws of mathematics itself. Ellie never discovers what this message is. She eventually reconvenes with the other members of the expedition, all who also have their own personal caretaker, and they're sent back to Earth. On Earth, however, it's revealed that although they were gone for what they believed to be a day, only about an hour had passed. Thus, those within the White House especially are extremely skeptical, or at least they act skeptical, of the stories given by each of the five scientists. The theories range from everything including a massive conspiracy to keep SETI funding alive, to a massive group delusion. Ellie and the other scientists are threatened into silence. However, there is some evidence that the vessel did go on a journey. Although, to the observer, it simply spun up, then turned off, with all photographs and accompanying evidence simply not working. Upon analysis, the dodecahedron itself was subject to extreme forces and pressures. All of the crew is also completely sure in what they saw, and upon returning to their scientific life with the threat of blackmail from the government, the five scientists are all working on their own way to prove the truth of their experiences. Publicly, they're seen as heroes. Sure, the explorers didn't find anything, but they risked their lives. The machine just didn't work. Still, while Dr. Ada is working on Einstein Rosenbridge theory, relating that to his experience with the wormholes, Ellie, who's back at Argus, is using the large arrays supercomputers to dig deep in into transcendental numbers, and specifically into pi. The computers finally find a pattern. When pi is calculated in base 11, deep within the number, a pattern of zeros and ones is found. When rasterized, it provides a visual of pi itself. I've put this image up on the screen, sourced it below. This is basically what she finds within pi. This is proof not only of her journey and her contact with the caretakers, but also an indication that the universe, its natural laws, its mathematics, its fundamental nature was designed by something. Whether this was an extremely advanced civilization, God, or something stranger, that's left for you to decide. But there seems to be nearly irrefutable proof of intelligent design in everything. And that is the story of Contact. At its heart, the story is about faith. Not necessarily a religious faith, but the requirements that we each hold in deciding what we believe to be true. Sagan, like the main character Ellie, is famously not an atheist, but agnostic. Did he believe in a Christian god? Probably not, but again, as with Ellie, he wasn't in a race to make up his mind. There was no compelling evidence yet, but there was no evidence which could exclude a creator of a traditional or non-traditional sense. We also see Ellie's connection with Palmer Joss. Now, she doesn't quite have the same connection she does with him in the movie, but the two to form an incredible kinship, and despite Josh being very religious and Ellie being not at all, they are not as different as they initially appear. And near the end of the novel, Josh becomes her true confidant and friend, one of the only people who can understand and listen to her experience before she finds proof. And that ties in nicely to one of the novel's other big themes, connectedness, the value of cooperation, humanity's place as a species and a family in a much bigger universe. Of course, there are also questions, especially early on, about why alien civilizations, if so common statistically, based on the number of stars and the conditions for life which must exist, are so silent. But that's my review of Contact, my look at the story and what lies a little bit deeper. If you enjoyed this sci-fi video that's not Star Wars, I've got a whole playlist as a personal review. I'd never gotten all the way through Contact before. The opening really turns me off. I don't like how Sagan writes 
young Ellie, and I made a good effort at the novel when I was in law school, but the amount of reading I had from school kind of killed my love of fiction for a while. But what a compelling and just overall great novel. I remember watching the movie probably a decade and a half ago, and I really enjoyed it when I watched it then, but the book is just so much deeper, I think so much more thoughtfully made, that it honestly diminished my enjoyment of the movie a bit, which is unfortunate because it's still a good movie overall. It does completely cut out the final aspect though of her finding the secrets of the nature of the universe on her own. I think that's a bit disappointing, but those are just my thoughts. Let me know yours down below. Thanks so much for watching guys. As always, may the force be with you.